Well, we are uh, moving from uh, the feeding of the 5,000 into uh, the Bread of Life discourse. But uh, before we get to it, there's still a few introductory things having to do with the, this crowd looking for Jesus. And because there are uh, spiritual lessons uh, for us in this, particularly in what Jesus says to them when they do finally find him, I thought we would uh, just pause on this text before we get into the other text, which is uh, quite involved, as a matter of fact. So let me just this morning read for you verses 22 through 27 of John chapter 6. And we're going to be focusing on the question, why is it that you seek Jesus? And of course, why you should seek him if you're not seeking him. So John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. The next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, the Father, God has set his seal. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now last time, again, we saw that Jesus, uh, we saw Jesus send his disciples across the sea to Capernaum while he went up on the mountain to pray. And again, among other things, Jesus likely prayed that his father would create a situation in which his disciples would learn to trust him, that his father would send a storm to keep them from reaching the shore until Jesus could come to them walking on the water. Now, not only did this uh, confirm it to them, again, that Jesus was the Messiah because no ordinary man could walk on water, it also strengthened their belief that he would come to them when they needed him the most. Now again, I just say that to remind us that's why the Lord sends trials into our lives. Being a Christian isn't easy, as I've already said. It's the most difficult life that really can be lived if it is lived for God's glory. But the end of this life is the best. And the trials that he sends are meant to strengthen us in our living this life in faith, in the faith and the grace that we need that we might better serve him here and increase those rewards that God has for us in eternity when we finally arrive in heaven. Now in our text, we see the, the crowds finally realize that Jesus was no longer with them. And they began looking for him until they finally found him in Capernaum. In other words, they were seeking after Jesus. Now, I realize they were doing this in a physical way, in a literal way. But we do need to see from this an example that we need to seek the Lord as well. That seeking Jesus is a good thing. It's actually what he commands us to do. But not if we're seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons. So this morning, what I'd like us to do is consider two things. First of all, that we should continually seek Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. But that we must seek him for the right reasons. And again, that's simple to say, but it becomes a, you know, it, it expands into a number of different ways. So first of all, let's consider that we should continually seek Jesus. And again, pointing to the crowd because this is what they did. We read in verses 22 through 24. The next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea, and again the other side from where Jesus and his disciples now were in Capernaum, they were close, close to Bethsaida, which you know was basically on the eastern side, sort of the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. 
uh, that crowd saw that there was no other small boat there except one. And that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now after Jesus had fed the 5,000 the day before, remember he sent his disciples ahead of him into the land of Gennesaret, which is where Capernaum was located. The crowds saw Jesus send them away. They saw that there was really only one boat there. Jesus had sent them away in that boat. They saw him withdraw to the mountain to pray, but they didn't see Jesus come down from the mountain and walk across the sea, as it were, to come to his disciples on the water. So on the next day, they began looking for him. But again, why were they looking for Jesus? They were still convinced that he was the Messiah. They were convinced that he was the prophet that Moses had predicted that was like to him. They believed he was the one who, as the Messiah, was going to lead them to victory over Rome. Remember, Jesus understood that they wanted to come and take him by force and make him king so that he could deliver them from the Romans. Well, now they're looking for Jesus in order that he might do this for them. But Jesus was nowhere to be found. And they had no idea where he was. Again, only one boat. The disciples had taken that. Jesus had not gone with them. By the way, we should ask ourselves the question, why so much about boats? Why don't they just walk? I mean, after all, these cities are on the coast. Well, they understood that taking the land route was actually quite difficult. And if Jesus had gone that way, he wouldn't have gotten very far, so they should have been able to find him because of the difficulty of the way, but they couldn't. So the question is, where was he? Well, after they had thoroughly searched the area, they decided that he must be in Capernaum because that's where Jesus lived. That's where he made his headquarters. He was basically living in Peter's house. Uh, this is also where he had sent the disciples. And they knew that Jesus would not, of course, separate himself for very long from them. So they decided to set out for Capernaum. But how are they going to get there? In God's providence, some small boats from Tiberias happened to be sailing by. Tiberias was on the other side of the sea, was on the western side of the, of the uh, Sea of Galilee, just south of Capernaum. It was a city that had been built by Herod in honor of Tiberius Caesar, which is why it was called Tiberius. And apparently these boats had business in that area and didn't mind picking up a couple of additional passengers. In this case, it would be quite a number of people. As I said before, it was certainly much faster to travel to the cities that were located on the coast by, uh, by boat rather than by foot. And so the crowd, desiring to find Jesus, came to Capernaum looking for him that they might again make him king. And verse 25 tells us that they actually found him. Now again, as I mentioned before, this is really a picture of what it is that we ought to be doing. We ought to be seeking Jesus. You know, if we're not seeking Jesus, we're not doing what it is the Lord calls us to do. Now why is it that we should seek the Lord Jesus and seek him continually? Well, for one thing, because that's what the Lord commands us to do. He says through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Now though this may primarily have to do with those who don't know the Lord, who are far from the Lord, needing to seek the Lord. I hope you understand if you're not seeking the Lord at all times, eventually you're going to find yourself in the situation where you're going to have to do what this text tells you to do. The reason why the Father sent His Son into the world was that we might seek Him. Not only the Jews, God's people at the time, His Old Covenant people, but also the Gentiles. That means all of us who are here this morning. This was something that was made clear at the Jerusalem Council. Luke writes in Acts 15, verses 13 through 18. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. 
Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After these things, I will return. And I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. And I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who were called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. You realize that there was a time when Basically, God was dealing only with the Jews. Those who would seek God had to become a Jew, as it were, not a physical descendant of Abraham, but they had to become of the faith of Abraham and trust in the God of Israel. But now the Lord has uh, not only sent his son into the world and in that sense raising up the fallen tabernacle of David because Jesus is the son of David, he is an heir to the throne, so that Israel might seek him, but also so that the Gentiles might seek him, which is why Jesus sent his disciples into all the world with the gospel, so that all mankind may seek the Lord. Well, why is it that we need to be seeking him? Well, it's because we need him. You see, if you don't know him, you will perish in your sins without him, which is why if you don't know him, you need to be seeking him for his salvation. Now, the thing is, it's true that in a certain sense, God is seeking. He is seeking those whom he will, but very often, in the case of those God is seeking, he will cause them to seek after him first before he allows himself to be found by them. In other words, if you're in need of salvation, you just can't sit idly by in, in the chair waiting for God to do something in your life. You need to begin to seek after him. You can't expect the Lord to save you unless you look for him. Unless you are looking for him, for his salvation, unless you put yourself in the way of salvation. That is, unless you put yourself in the place where the Lord, when he saves, is pleased to save. And that is certainly under the preaching of his gospel. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. This is what God makes powerful through the work of his Holy Spirit to save. So unless you're interested, as it were, in eternal life, unless God by his grace has made you interested, the Lord's really not interested in giving it to you. He only gives it to those who are looking for him, or I should say generally that's the way he works. I already gave you one example of a man who wasn't even looking for him, and yet the Lord sought him out and saved him, and that is Saul who became the apostle Paul. But again, that's why the Lord sends his messengers out with the gospel. That's why he sends you and I out armed with the gospel so that those who are out there who are ignorant or in darkness, who don't know that, that there is even an offer of salvation, will know that that offer of good news exists. And knowing that it does, that they would reach out to him, that they might find him. That's why the gospel is preached here. That's why you need to sit under the gospel if you don't know him. You need to know that God is in earnest when he says that all who repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he will save them. But you need to realize, too, that if you already have come to Christ, if you already believe on him and you've turned from your sins, that the Lord still wants you to seek after him. As a matter of fact, we need to seek him continually because there are certain things that we need from the Lord that we need on a daily basis. We need his grace. We need his strength. We need his love. And if we're not continually seeking these things, these things will weaken within us. We need power to break free from the influences of this world, which you know are quite powerful and are continually drawing us away from the Lord. We need to seek Him for the strength to break free from these things so that we might better serve Him, that we might be more faithful servants, that we might bring more honor to His name in this world. We're never going to be able to do that, as I've said before, as long as our hearts are divided as long as we're captivated to any degree by this world, to the degree that we are, to that degree we will be weakened and unable to serve the Lord. 
So the Lord commands us to seek after Him. We need to be seeking after Him. But there's also a way in which we must seek after Him, and that is diligently. And I think we have a picture of that in our passage this morning with the diligence that this crowd was, was exhibiting in looking for Jesus. They looked all over for Him, trying to figure out where He was. And when they found that He wasn't where they were, they were willing to travel across the sea. And they searched until they found him. If you want to find Jesus, you need to look for him. And you need to not only look for him, but you must be willing to put the effort that is required until you actually do find him. By the way, I hope you, um, I hope you recognize that um, there is a difference between uh, praying and praying uh, as we, I think, were encouraged recently with that importunity, with that effort with that kind of zeal that won't stop looking until we find. I think sometimes we content ourselves with just lifting up a simple prayer and thinking once we've done that, we've done everything we need to do, but we need to seek the Lord until we actually find Him. And I think if you've done that, you know what that means. You know how the Lord answers your prayer. You know how you have a sense that you've actually connected with Him and that He has heard you. And though it is true, He hears everything we say and do and sees everything we do as well. It's also true that he doesn't hear us in the way that we need for him to hear us until we seek him with the kind of effort that he would be sought. So you need to seek him with that kind of effort and you also need to look where it is that he is going to be found. As I said before, you're not going to find him except where he is and he isn't in the world. They realized he wasn't on that side of the sea so they began to look to where they knew they would find him. We can't find him if we're going to look in places where he's not going to be found. For instance, you won't find him in the bar. I think that's, that's obvious. You're not going to find him at the sporting event. You're not going to find him in the theater. You're not going to find him in the concert. That's not where he is, you see. Well, where is the Lord? Well, if you don't know him, he's only going to be found in the gospel. He can be found where his people are gathering together for worship. You can hear him where he speaks, when his word is read and preached. You can even read the Bible yourself and hear him speak. But his voice that raises the dead can particularly be heard where the gospel is being preached and when it is being shared by his children, one with another, as it were. That's, you see, where you need to look. That's where he's found. And, of course, if you know him, you know where to find him. He's not far from each one of us. You will find him in the places I've already mentioned, but you will particularly find him in prayer, which the Lord promises that he will hear if you come to him in faith and diligently seek after him. Now, I want you to notice in our text here as well that the Lord is even willing to help you find him if you are willing to seek after him. Because we ask the question, where did all these small boats come from that were from Tiberias? Well, they came from Tiberias, of course. That's what we're told in the text. But why were they there? They were there because God in his providence put them there so that the people who were looking for Jesus might actually be able to find him, you see. And the point is that God sometimes sends help. If you are sincerely seeking the Lord, he will help you find him. But again... You must be willing, you must be seeking, you must be looking for Jesus. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If you're looking for a promise from God that you're asking, you're seeking, you're knocking is going to be successful. Here it is. God promises he will answer your prayers and he will be found if you seek him, if you seek him diligently. And Jesus is worth finding. Of course, if you don't believe that, you're never going to look for him in the way that you should. If you don't know him, you need to realize salvation from hell. And eternal life is worth whatever effort you have to put into it to receive it. And again, there is effort that the Lord requires us to put into it sometimes, sometimes not. There is this weaning from sin. There is this breaking free from the world. There is this seeking after him, this desire that one must have that 
you know, goes beyond, as it were, indifference. And certainly the same thing is true of the blessings that God has promised to each one of us who actually belong to him. That we have to desire those blessings before the Lord will give them to us. But they're worth it. And we need to realize that they're worth it. And we have to have that kind of desire that says, I cannot live without these things. I must find Jesus. So the Lord tells us that we must continually be seeking after him. That we don't just kick ourselves into idol and say, you know what, I've, I've given my hour, I've read my chapter, I've lifted up my five minutes of prayer, or maybe I've given thanks at a meal. God wants us to be seeking him continually. That is where the power is. The power to be mighty in the Lord. The power to live the kind of life God calls us to live. It's not going to come from just a simple request of the Lord without this kind of effort in seeking him. But again, secondly, as I mentioned before, the Lord would have us seek him, but we must seek him for the right reasons. Now, what these people were doing was a good thing, but the motive made it a bad thing. They were not seeking him for the right reasons. John continues in verses 24 through 27. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Now, again, this crowd was zealous to find Jesus, but they were looking for him for some other thing than what it was that Jesus actually had to offer. They asked him the question, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now, from verse 49 of this chapter, which we haven't read here, appears to be in the synagogue. They knew Jesus was headquartered in Capernaum. They knew he had sent his disciples in Capernaum. They knew they would find him in Capernaum. But where in Capernaum? Well, they knew if they looked at the synagogue, he was most likely to be there because of his desire, constant desire, to honor his father by teaching his people. If you want to find Jesus, you're going to find him where Jesus is worshipped. But of course, their question wasn't really aimed at when Jesus got there. It was really question, uh, aimed at how Jesus got there. Uh, how did you get over here when there was only one boat? Now, do, I want you to notice Jesus doesn't answer that question. Sometimes people ask the wrong questions, right? And sometimes we ask the wrong questions. And Nicodemus, you know, he was asking the wrong question when he was talking with Jesus. So Jesus doesn't answer the wrong questions, what Jesus does is he spends his time telling people what they really need to hear. That's what he did, with, as I said, with Nicodemus, and that's what he's always going to do with us. He says in verse 26, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. He's basically saying it's good that you sought me, but your motive in seeking me isn't good. Uh, Jesus knew what was going on in their hearts. He not, he not only knows what we're doing, but Jesus knows why we're doing it, and he knows whether or not why we're doing what we're doing is a good or a bad thing. Now, Jesus is saying to them that they weren't seeking him for what they ought to have been seeking him for, which is his teaching. He says it wasn't because you saw this sign, and that sounds kind of strange because sometimes Jesus reproves them because they you know, the, the crowds that are following him because they're just looking for him to do another sign. You know, amaze us, Jesus. Do something miraculous. We don't get to see very much happening in the world today. It's kind of boring. Do something that is spectacular that, that we can, you know, basically be thrilled by. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. You know, you didn't seek me because you saw these signs. But that's why, he says, in this case, you should have been seeking me. These signs that Jesus did, of course, were the things that proved that what he was saying was God's truth. The very thing that proved to Nicodemus, remember, he says, we know that you're a teacher sent from God because no one can do the things that you're doing unless God is with him. 
You're not seeking me because these signs have authenticated the fact that I'm God's messenger and that I am preaching you God's truth. It wasn't because they wanted to hear what God really had to say. No, their motive was really a much more base motive. It was because they ate of the loaves and were filled. Matthew Henry writes this, It wasn't because he taught them, but because he fed them. Their interest, in other words, wasn't a spiritual interest, but it was a carnal or an earthly or a physical interest. And so Jesus redirects them. He tells them again what they need to hear. Verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father has set his seal. Now again here, Jesus is pointing them to the same thing that he had earlier pointed the Samaritan woman, only he's using a different image. He said to her, don't drink this water, which once you've drunk will leave you thirsty again, but go after that water, which once you've drunk will forever quench your thirst. Here he says, don't work for the food that perishes. I mean, you've eaten of those loaves and you're hungry again but work for the food that endures to eternal life. That is that bread that you can eat, that living bread, which will forever satisfy your hunger. Well, what is the food that perishes? What is the water that leaves you thirsty that he says you should not be going after? Again, it's the things of the world. The things that only satisfy for a while, but then leave you thirsty for more. It's the money, it's the fame, it's the, the fun. The things that, that people try to hold on to in this world, if, if they could, of course, but shouldn't hold on to. Solomon writes in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. What a vivid image. And I think Solomon here is wrapping up all the things of the world in the wealth of the world, which basically is, well, is that which opens the door to whatever it is you want. Fame, the wealthy are famous, to pleasure, the wealthy have all the pleasure they want. You know, it's sort of like wealth is the key. Solomon says, don't wear yourself to gain it. Cease from it. When you set your eyes on it, it's going to take off from you. Matthew Henry writes this, those that have the largest share of them, that is of the world and of its riches, are not sure to have them while they live, but are sure to leave them and lose them when they die. Okay, this is the food that perishes. This is the water which will always leave you thirsty. It's something that most people aren't going to have in the world, but even if they have it, there's no guarantee they're going to keep it. But there is one thing that is sure, and when they die, they're going to have to give it all up. Now, if that's true, if that's what this food is like, Jesus is saying, why work for this? Why not work for the food which endures instead to eternal life? For that happiness which God will give you in this world, that contentment that you can have. As Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in, either plenty or in want, because I have Christ. I have everything that I need. Why not labor for the riches and the honor and the pleasure that the Lord will give you in heaven where you're going to be able to keep it forever? This is what Jesus has to give, you see, if you will only seek him. And by the way, Jesus points out that he is the only one who can actually give these things to you because it's on him. The Father, even God, has set his seal. In other words, the Father has shown us that Jesus is the giver of these gifts by allowing him to do these signs. Remember, he says, you're not seeking me because of these signs. These signs prove that Jesus is the one who has these things to give. You're seeking me because of the loaves. You should instead be looking at the signs. That's the Father's seal that Jesus says, I have the ability to give to you these things, the food that doesn't perish, the water, which satisfies eternally. So again, the Lord calls us to seek him, but he calls us to seek him for the right things, the things that Jesus actually has to give, the things that he wants to give us, the things that will benefit us, not just in this world,
but the world that is to come. So in closing, ask yourself this morning, first of all, are you seeking Jesus? That's what you need to be doing. Now, if you are, that's a good thing. But you also need to be asking yourself, why are you seeking him? What is it that you want from him? Are you looking for loaves? Are you looking for the bread that perishes, the water that allows you or that keeps you, as it were, thirsty? Well, sadly, that's what many in the church today are really seeking Jesus for. They are seeking him, not for the things he gives, but for the things he doesn't want you to have for the things of this world, for the money and for the fame and what comes through these things, pleasure. Again, sadly, a lot of these so-called Christian leaders who have raised themselves up as leaders are seeking for nothing other than these things, for money and fame and fortune and pleasure, the things that come from these things, sadly. Some are seeking Jesus for other things that, again, amount to nothing more than loaves. I mean, how many people are seeking Jesus for nothing more than healing? They just want to be well. Or maybe in, in, in our churches it tends not to be so much those kinds of things, but maybe you're seeking him if you're young to please your parents. In some cases, sadly, sometimes people come to church, sometimes youth come to church because they're seeking a young woman or a young man as a spouse. That happened in my mother's life. My dad came to church to seek my mother and got my mother and then stopped going to church. That happens, right? And that's a wrong motive to come to church. I'm not saying you can't find a spouse in church. I'm just saying that that shouldn't be your primary reason for coming. Or maybe it's because you want to keep up appearances and you want to please your friends. Your friends are Christians and you have to maintain that, that aura, as it were, of being a Christian you need to ask yourself, why are you seeking the Lord? What is it that you're after? Well, Jesus here tells you why you should be seeking him. If you don't know him, you should be here seeking him that you might be saved, that he might have mercy on your soul. And if that's the case with you, you need to ask him for that grace. But if you do know him, you need to be seeking him for his grace and his strength to overcome sins, not for the things of the world beyond, of course, what you need, but you need to seek him for the power to break free from that addiction that we all have, which is the addiction to the things of the world. And again, we all have it. We all struggle with it. Every single one of us struggle with these things. But we need to seek the Lord to break free from that influence so that we might better serve him that we may better honor him in the world and gain the glory that is in the world to come. That only comes by seeking Jesus. So Jesus says to you this morning, don't work for the food that perishes. Don't drink from the well that leaves you thirsting for more. But seek for that food and that water that forever satisfies that Jesus alone has to give that actually is found only in Jesus, only in trusting him and receiving him and, of course, receiving everything that is in him. Seek Jesus alone because the Father has set his seal on him alone. Well, may the Lord help us to do that. Let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's pray that God would give us the grace to seek him in that way.